talking to himself. <laughs> and the audience just gives up. They can't understand him. It's very hard. There's a story after World War II. Bohr went to Winston Churchill and tried to convince him. Winston Churchill was the Prime Minister of England. Tried to convince Churchill to sign an agreement to stop <coughs> making nuclear weapons. Bohr was very concerned that the world would stop, start producing a lot of nuclear weapons and England was the only one that was stopping him from his contract, from getting everyone to agree. So Bohr went in to talk to Churchill and he started his presentation. After three minutes, Churchill said, I cannot handle it. Please, get out, out. <laughs> and he kicked Bohr out. Bohr could not keep Churchill's attention to make his key point. And of course, history is different as a result of that. We did not get the uh, no atomic bomb contract signed. We have a lot of bombs around the world today. Could have been different if he'd been a better speaker. If he, his heart was in the right place, but he just didn't have the speaking ability. And Churchill also had no patience for this kind of slow, bad style. The other one I want to show you is Volhard. Volhard, even though she also was an ESL, second language learner, she used very simple speech, simple sentences. And that is a key point here. This is a very key point for conferences. When we are speaking, we are not trying to show off to our audience the big vocabulary that we know. We are not using big words to impress people. We are trying to express our meaning. Different motivation. Not impress, express. And that makes speaking different from writing, because when I write a big word, someone can get a dictionary and see the meaning of my word. But when I use a big word in speaking, you can't get a dictionary and look it up. And when you are trying to think, what does the word mean, you miss the whole point of my sentence. I lose you because I'm trying to impress you. So we want to be simple. We want to use short, simple words. And we don't want to use too many words. Never use two words when you can use one. Never use a long word when you can use a short word. We are emphasizing expressing our meaning, not impressing the audience. And this is particularly important. When we are at an international conference, where not everyone had the same English teacher we had. Some people are from Korea, Japan, India, all over the world. And when you use a big word, Maybe they do not understand, very likely, that they don't know. So again, don't use big words. Sometimes students do this all the time. They're preparing their speech. They don't know the meaning of a word. So they type the English word into the English-Chinese dictionary. And they get several English words. Short, longer, longer, really long. And they copy and paste the really long one in. And I say, why? What does that mean? And they say, I don't know, but it's high class. <laughs> about the meaning, express the meaning. And this was Bohr's problem, and I don't want that to be yours as well. We'll take a look here at his speech in a moment. Here's George uh, Bohr's Nobel Prize acceptance speech. I'm going to give you the first few sentences. Well, this is one sentence here, actually. <laughs> He begins, today as a consequence of the great honor of the Swedish Academy of Sciences has done me in awarding me this year's Nobel Prize for <laughs> Physics for my work on the structure of the atom. It is my duty to give an account of the results of this work and I think that I shall be acting in accordance with the traditions of the Nobel Foundation if I give this report in the form of a survey of the development which has taken place in the last few years within the field of physics to which this work belongs. Ooh. It's really long and just complicated, hard to catch it. And this is to a very general audience. I mean, Nobel Prize speech. Here's his second speech. <laughs> the second two sentences. The present state of atomic theory is characterized by the fact that we do not believe, only believe of the existence of atoms to be proved beyond a doubt, but also we even believe that we have an intimate knowledge of the constituents of the individual atoms. Oh. Here's the next sentence. I cannot at this occasion give a survey of the scientific developments that I have led to this result. And he says, I cannot give a survey. But then he gives a survey. <laughs> I can only recall the discovery of the electron toward the close of the last century, which furnished the final verification and led to the conclusive formulation of the conception of the atomic nature of a lessness. He loves nouns. Noun, noun, noun. And it makes it so hard. There's no verbs in his sentence. 
uh, since the discovery by Faraday of the fundamental laws of electrochemical theory and its greatest triumph in the electronic disassociation theory of Archimedes. Wow. Complicated, long <laughs> sentences. By the way, Faraday was a wonderful speaker as well. I don't have quotes from him here, but he was a great, simple, strong speaker. Let's contrast Bohr's speech with Volhard. Well, here's Einstein talking about Bohr. He said, Bohr states his opinion like one perpetually groping, like trying to feel, and never like one who believes himself to be in possession of definite truth. Einstein says he's not sure of himself. He always talks like he doesn't know what he's really saying. Here's another someone uh, comparing Einstein and Bohr, another scientist. He says, whereas Einstein tried to... Okay, I already did this one. Uh, next one. Here's Bohart's Nobel Prize speech. I want you to notice how she uses simple sentences, how some of her sentences go specific for the, specific, uh, for the specialized audience. But other sentences are general, so that everyone can understand. And this is a, a, a very important concept in scientific presentations. Our audience is mixed. Some people are specialists in, a, in our domain. Some are specialists in the general domain. And some are not specialists at all. How can we give information that is interesting to all of them? Well, we will frequently dip in and out, in and out, from specialized to general. We will tell some special knowledge and then say why it's important to a general audience. We will give, special, we'll give implications that everyone can understand. We'll introduce the problem in a way everyone can understand. And yet, we also dip into some specific terminology when we need to. And that's what she does so well here in her Nobel speech. Let's take a look at what she does. In the life of animals, complex forms alternate with simple ones. That's nice, short, strong sentence in the beginning. An individual develops from a single one-celled egg that bears no resemblance on the complex structure and pattern displayed in the juvenile and adult form. The process of embryonic uh, development with its highly ordered increase in complexity, accompanied by perfect reproducibility, is controlled by a subset of the animal genes. Animals have a large number of genes. Notice that short sentence. The exact number is not known for any multicellular organism, nor is it known how many and which are required for the development of complexity, pattern, and shape during embryogenesis. Now, here's her only technical word so far, embryogenesis. But, I mean, we can probably guess what that means, even if we're not in her area. We know embryo, we know genesis means beginning. We're pretty sure what that means. To identify these genes and to understand their functions is a major issue in biological research. Isn't that a great beginning sentence? Even if I'm not from her domain, I can appreciate what she has done. Because she gives me some simple sentences, but also she talks to the specialist as well, at the same time, telling him what her contribution is. Here are some very successful scientific presenters, famous for being very interesting, almost showmen. From a very young age, they were natural, even though many of them were not first language speakers. Here are people who became very strong later in their careers. They started out being very weak speakers, very poor, but they consciously tried to become better. They consciously developed their speaking skill, and they talk about it at great length in their books. And here is finally one who was always very, very shy her whole life, extremely terrified of people, and yet overcame that to become a wonderful speaker, Marie Curie. You know, there's a story about Marie Curie. Even after 20 years of being a professor, after 20 years, on the day she would have to do class, her daughter would say she would wake up early in the morning and start walking around nervously. She would go to her room, close the door. She would become very nervous one hour before her talk, which was in the evening. And just before she walked out, she would be sweating, shaking very badly. She would walk out in front of her class. Her students loved her. She only had 20 students. When she came out, all the students would rise in respect because she won the Nobel Prize. She was a great scientist. You know, they would all rise, and then they would sit down, and she would begin to talk. But she spoke very well. She overcame it. She was a very interesting teacher, but never overcame the fear. Was always terrified 
of, of speaking in public, and yet was a great scientific presenter. Here's Michael Faraday on presenting. He says, lectures depend entirely for their value on the manner in which they are given. It is not the matter, not the subject so much as the man. He's emphasizing that in scientific presentation, it's not enough to only have good results. We have to present those results well if we want our audience to see and appreciate our value, our contribution. Other scientists used analogies, examples, and stories. Otto, uh, Otto Frisch, when he's describing the size of a nucleus, said, if an atom were enlarged to the size of a bus, the nucleus would be like the dot on this eye. You know, he liked to use analogies, stories. Einstein <coughs> used to talk about shooting sparrows in the dark to describe the likelihood of producing nuclear energy. Uh, Fred uh, Soshkin, when describing his work on turbine blades, said the amount of power produced by a single gas turbine blade equals that of a Maserati sports car. They tried to make their language easy for the common person to understand, easy for the student to understand. They used analogies and examples that would be appreciated by their audience. Here's a scientist, a famous writer, uh, on Linus Pauling, another Nobel Prize winner. He says, on March 21, I attended a lecture given by Linus Pauling. This talk was the best talk by anyone on any subject that I have ever heard. The talk was more than a talk to me. It filled me with a desire of my own to become a speaker. This is the young scientist who, of course, later wrote more books than any other scientific scholar. Here's another James Watson talking about Pauling's presentation. Again, Linus Pauling. He said, Pauling's talk was made with his usual dramatic flair. The words came out as if he had been in show business his whole <laughs> life. A curtain kept his model hidden until near the end of his lecture when he proudly <coughs> unveiled his latest connect, uh, creation. Then with eyes twinkling, fire in his eyes, Linus explained the specific characteristics that made his model, the helix, uniquely beautiful. Even if he were to say nonsense, his mesmerized students would never know because of his, his, his unquenchable self-confidence. So here is a, a Nobel Prize winner and a showman, a showman. Robert Feynman, great physicist. His lectures were so popular on physics that professors from his faculty, his own faculty there at Berkeley, would pack his lecture hall. There was no room for his students because the other teachers loved his lectures so much. He was uh, just a wonderful speaker at explaining very complicated concepts in a simple way. Feynman absolutely riveted the attention of everyone in the room for the entire time he was there. His need to do that explains some of the racy stories he used to tell about himself, but it lies close to the core of what made him a great teacher. For Feynman, the lecture hall was a theater, and the lecturer a performer, responsible for providing drama and fireworks, as well as facts and figures. This was true regardless of his audience, whether he was talking to undergraduates or graduate students, to his lecture colleagues, or the general public. My point in giving you all these stories is not that we have to give fireworks and be like showmen, but we do need to be conscious and aware of the impact we are having on our audience. Great scientists understand that great science is only appreciated when it's